book about the analog experiments. I thought of showing you a couple of tomographies of volcanoes to show you what one can see from uh, tomographic studies. Actually, there are many that are coming out now with very nice tomographies. And this is just a very small selection, but I thought it was instructive <coughs> to show you. <coughs> Some of these, also because this is one of the tomographies in general, is one of the expertise that the group here at LCDP has. And so it happens quite a lot that students end up doing tomographies in their projects. And so I thought of showing you some of the most recent that I found. So this one is on Sandorini. Sandorini is a, an island in the Hellenic Arc. So this is Greece. This is Creta in the Mediterranean. And Sandorini is here. Uh, and it's right <coughs> above the subduction of the African plate below Greece. So this is the island. It's a beautiful island with a, a very nice landscape and it is uh, a caldera. Um, so here is uh, like a bathymetry where one can see that it is like a volcanic edifice with a caldera at the top. And it has uh, um, like a, a ring structure where you have this uh, the elevated part, and then it has uh, an elevated inner uh, part called the kameni, which means like chimney. And here, this uh, ball here that you see is the location of an inferred inflation that occurred a few years ago where people, so there was some deformation. Of course, the deformation was uh, difficult to see because it was only observed uh, on the island, but a uh, uh, magmatic source was located in this point. This is another seamount connected somehow to the island because there are also dikes that run through this uh, Columbo line. This is the Columbo seamount. Um, this is like a rough history of eruptions. Um, this is like uh, different phases of of, erupt of eruptions in the in the caldera. And these are vents, <coughs> like older vents, in the last uh, 180,000 years. Some of them effusive, some of them were explosive and plinian. And uh, so probably Santorini was uh, one of the causes of uh, some historical um, crisis in the Mediterranean, probably due to a tsunami caused by the eruption um, that are, are, uh, are uh, in, in the history books. So it's, uh, probably it has a lot of relevance for Hazard to study Santorini. So, um, uh, what I found in, I find interesting in this uh, in this um, tomography, so these are different cross sections. This is at 0 0.5 kilometer depth, one kilometer, 1.6, and 2.8. And what I find particularly striking is that already at one kilometer depth, 1.6 even more, you can see that there is like a um, an anomaly of very low seismic velocities here, which is probably, so they, they discuss a lot this anomaly of seismic velocities. This is like a cross-section, um, these two lines, like uh, across this uh, low velocity area here. And one can see that the low velocity, of course, is shallow, but also it goes very deep um, just below the caldera. And actually not the entire caldera. If you see here, the caldera rim is from here to here, but actually in a body that is actually here at the center. This is where it really, uh, the velocity is low. So, 
they discuss it a lot actually this paper is very cool because they they don't stop at just showing the data but they discuss a lot of papers that propose models and propose um, interpretations for what they see and so they think basically what they see is like a cylinder of uh, um, very porous and unconsolidated material that has a low velocity because it's really like un so unconsolidated it probably was created during the collapse of the caldera and then below this you have the magma accumulation and then they discuss what this could be so they calculate more or less what uh, at four kilometers depth what the lithostatic pressure can be and then they also say so if you want to assess the stresses in the volcano lithostatic pressure is going to give you this picture uh, and it's composed actually of two components that they calculate. So here they have basically what you would see from just the topographic load. If you just account for the topography, the lithostatic stress would be this. But then if you also account for subsurface density difference, so basically one, one thing is to calculate only the topography and one thing is to consider also that there are some volumes that have a very low density. And then to calculate the stress, uh, as, if, as if it, so to add this to the topography difference, you know? And then if you do this, actually this is not so small. You have to, so what they argue is that it is very important to check the inner structure of volcanoes because then you, only by considering both, like from the topography and also from the inner structure, then you have a complete picture and you end up having these results. And then you have really a correlation below uh, of the point where, where the lithostatic pressure is the, the, the smallest and where the magma accumulation is from, because you can see in this picture that it's exactly correlated with where magma is stored. So basically where the least weight, not only from the topography, but also from the subsurface structure, is where magma ends up uh, accumulating. I, th I, th I think it's a very cool study, this one. And then I wanted to show you also another one. This is a Liero. It was this island in the Canary Islands where they could have continue during the break? No, it was very quiet. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> I had a very relaxing break, but now. Yeah, so this is a Liero. And this is, a, again, a, to, a tomography that, uh, you remember it had all these many dikes that went into all directions, and actually they used the seismicity from these dikes to, to calculate the tomography. It was very useful because they went in all directions and so you could really cover the entire islands with a lot of rays. And what they saw also here is this, uh, yeah, if you start from 1.2 to 2.0 kilometers and you go down, of course it gets a bit uh, wider because this is, uh, because the stations are only at the top of the island, right? And so the shallowest part, you don't have a broad vision. You have a broader vision, maybe less resolution, but a broader vision on the deeper part. Because the rays are going to come uh, from the earthquakes to your stations. What one can see is that uh, um, here, already, already at this depth, one can see three areas like here, here, and also here, where you have a 10% perturbation in the VP, so like the VP velocity is low here, here, and here, and you can really see it here in this figure, while it is high here, here, and here. And one can see that actually for this study, you even have a correlation between the, so if you calculate this, uh, um, topographic load stress, you would find that it is, there is a correlation between the areas that uh, have high VP velocity with areas that are subject to high 
topographic load and low BP velocity <coughs> where you don't have so much load. So uh, in this paper, particular paper, they interpret it as a stress because they also consider that most dikes <coughs> actually go this way, this way, and also this way. So they say this, uh, the blue parts are like stress barriers and the dikes tend to avoid the stress barriers. Um, I think it's a good idea <coughs> and probably would be worth to... <coughs> if it works. To examine it a bit more in this way. Is it like every day? Was it like this morning? This dress is now. Okay. It would be a nice idea to go a bit ahead, I think. And... Uh, so I, I see, I foresee that in the next years the tomographies will uh, be more linked to models of volcano stress because they, at least tomographies at volcanoes, because they provide a lot of evidence and <coughs> they can be used to test models where stress is controlled by topography and inner structure and also to basically figure out to help figure out where uh, likely eruption sites could be. This is like a vertical cross-section. And one can <coughs> probably also see here. So one can see those features that I described, which are these uh, red parts here that actually show the compression part or the unloaded part because it's a lower velocity. But then one can also see this area here, which is low velocity. So this area is probably uh, the area, they can visualize the area where magma is accumulating in this volcano. <coughs> in, this in this case, actually, it's the opposite. So magma is accumulating right below the area of, uh, so right below the summit, as you see, because it's probably this area here, which is right below the blue part in the middle, here. So one could think, why in one case is the area where you have the least topographic stress, and why in one case is the area where you have the highest topographic stress, and that magma is accumulating? Why would you think uh, this is the case? Do you have an explanation for this? <laughs> we discussed this a bit uh, in, the, in the first week of lecture, we discussed that when you have a big volcano load, this volcano load is going to attract all the dikes and they are going to co co basically go very close and maybe create a magma chamber and this is going to be just below the summit of the volcano. So this fits with this idea, while the other one fits the idea that if you have a caldera, then, uh, no. then like any magma that will come from below will actually go this way and then f actually be blocked by the decompression and not uh, ascend anymore and just be there. So it's actually the opposite, <coughs> the opposite thing. In one case you put a load, in the other case you remove the load. But in both cases you end up trapping the magma by different processes. In one case you create a decompression <coughs> and you trap the magma because it becomes horizontal. In the other case you create a compression and you trap the magma because you, the magma is vertical, it would like to ascend, but then you are compressing from the top with a big weight. So it's like, it may seem counterintuitive that you have uh, opposite, yes. <laughs> You want some water? I don't know, I'll take you. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Do you have any question while she's away? How wide uh, caldera now? I mean, what is the largest uh, caldera? caldera? What's the caldera? Yeah. It's a yellow stone and it is uh, 90 by 70 kilometers. It's very big, 
Could you repeat, uh, please, uh, the last part? I mean, uh, the difference between uh, the two parts? Uh, yes, so we discussed uh, during the first okay. week that there are, uh, um, when you, uh, that uh, basically magma propagates, tends to follow the most compressive stress axis and be perpendicular to the least compressive stress axis because magma wants to open and create some volume where to, put, so where to accommodate the magma and uh, the most convenient, energetically convenient or least, uh, least energy path is uh, when you are perpendicular to the least compressive stress. Okay, so basically when you put a big load, the big load is going to compress your crust and then all the magma will tend to go towards the load. However, the big load also stops the ascent because it compresses and then when the compression becomes too big the magma ascending will stop and then you will build a magma chamber just below the big load at some kilometer depth that uh, the depth also will depend on various parameters like uh, how magma buoyancy and uh, these kind of things but also the amount of load so if the volcano is becoming bigger and taller then probably magma chamber will also go a bit deeper. Yeah. However, if you actually remove some load, you decapitate the volcano, then you create an opposite effect. The opposite effect is that you actually flip the stresses before they were compressive and they become extensional, and so magma from below will uh, try, tend to spread, <coughs> and generally tend to spread just below, just uh, within the rim, because the rim is again a big low. Yeah. So it will spread until it feels the, the compression of the rim, and then you will have, uh, um, instead of like a body like this of magma, you will have a bigger, but very thin, and the tallest body, so thin maybe, but maybe also different, different layers, um, but the wider because generally calderas are relatively wide. So they are like this one. I don't know if they were kilometers, but just the typical size is like 10 kilometers. Now this one. You can read the degrees. Anyway, this is how much? It's like six seconds. So how much is that? Less than 10 degrees, probably. Um, it will be around uh, 6, no, it's like 10, 10 kilometers, right? 6 seconds, because 1 degree is 100 kilometers or <coughs> more. And so, yeah, and so basically this is 1 tenth of that, right? 6. Well, anyway, <laughs> it's probably around 10 kilometers, probably. Anyway, it's a very typical size for calderas, 10 kilometers. There are smaller ones, and there are uh, only a few very big ones. Like Yellowstone is really an exception, really big. There are a few with 20, yeah. Um, yes, yeah, so, so in, this is also why calderas have biggest eruptions, because they have uh, a big... Uh, system. A bit, yeah, also it's a bit the chicken and the egg, like they have bigger eruptions so they actually create calderas, right? Because so it sustains the creation of the caldera because if you have a bigger eruption then you drain everything and you have a collapse. But the collapse is also going to help in uh, recreating this uh, bigger system and then creating a big volume below. Okay, so just about tomographies. And now it's a still a dike, but uh, it will go into uh, an analog experiment. So it's uh, to introduce the uh, topic of analog experiments. So this is Saudi Arabia. This uh, province here, this is the Red Sea. We have looked already at this type from a different point of view from crossal deformation. These are uh, all basal flows, provinces. Um, here, Egypt, with reality, Ethiopia. So here is the Red Sea. And the eruption was in this, in this area here. And this was the surface deformation. 
and we saw that this uh, was like a normal dike, but it had this a bit weird wedge shape where you have um, the part in the middle, which is the graben, that instead of having two parallel lines, it had this a uh, bit wedge shaped um, area. And so this uh, analog experiment was done to understand why. So this we already saw that it was a bit of the development of the dike. So it started with a very little deformation and not so much faulting and then it went ahead <coughs> and it became bigger deformation and more subsidence in the middle and bigger deformation. And here one can see that the model returns a bigger, this bigger opening as time goes by and the more faulting as time goes by. So now, uh, just to show you what you can do in the laboratory to understand better what you see. So this is basically a sandbox. Inside you have crushed silica. This is seen from above. It's not that big, it's just uh, this thick, this box. And then you have uh, a camera monitoring what is happening. And then you have uh, an engine, a motor, that basically pushes from the side something that is shaped like this. It's like a moving wall. And this moving wall, it's shaped like a dike, basically, and is pushed into the silica. So instead of being a dike that ascends, it's different, okay? It's a dike that opens more while it is already in place. So basically you put the dike up and then you, you open it like this. And this was done to observe the development of folds at the top of the dike. So if you do this, maybe it will become more clear uh, as I show it. So basically you are pushing this uh, dike from the side here into the sun and you start to form, so basically this, the dike is here, right? And it's starting to push. Then you start to form some folds where the tip of the dike is, and then you start to form these folds, like this, <coughs> they elongate, they, you have several branches, they elongate, and they are like this. And here is the displacement, so you start to see some uh, uh, subsidence here at the top, here exactly at the line you don't see the, the subsidence that you generally are supposed to see, but this is like a boundary effect. And then you see this that moves upwards and also in this direction. And also you can model the <coughs> focal mechanisms basically of these folds by taking into account um, the dip and the rake measured from the figures, then you can see basically what the focal mechanisms are. So basically what you see is that at the tip, just above, so basically the wedge, the wedge shapes comes because the dike is shaped like this. So basically the part that is uh, more shallow, if it is, uh, it creates a thinner drop. And then the parts that are more, that are deeper, they create a wider graben. And so basically this is why the graben is shaped like this, because the dike is not as deep everywhere. It's not the same deep depth everywhere. It's in some places it's deeper, and then uh, it was flattening enough that the stress at the surface was becoming big enough. But, uh, yeah. So you can learn about how the faults are, and uh, if you are, um, if you think of an anal analog experiment. So in general, one can have many questions. So why analog experiments? Um, we will talk about scaling. We will talk about uh, application to calderas. So in general, 
Uh, okay, so let's go back to volcano physics. Here there is some some written text. So when you when you read it later, maybe you find it useful. Now for the presentation is maybe too much to read, but anyway, in general, volcano physics, you want to provide some quantitative explanations for the phenomena that you see. And then, of course, uh, you have also societal motivation because you want to calculate the hazards that the volcano poses, so that you can protect a uh, society and assist uh, authorities if there is a crisis. Okay, what about experiments in volcano physics? There are a lot of different kinds of experiments and here there are four reasons why they are useful and different experiments may be useful for different reasons. Did I actually turn? Yes, <laughs> I couldn't remember. So like one reason is like the most basic. It's a tool to explore a novel phenomena and provide a systematic observation. So just really very basic. Like I have no idea of why something is happening, really no idea. I try to simulate the same thing in the laboratory, trying to simplify stuff. So I just, uh, isolate some of the processes that are occurring in nature and I'm trying to replicate them at a smaller scale to get inspiration basically, getting inspiration but also systematic observation. So like uh, in nature I can see this maybe uh, a few times because I don't have so many observations or I have really to look at the global scale but then things uh, change you know because if you go from a volcano to the next and not necessarily have the same conditions. And so in the laboratory you can repeat and repeat and repeat the same thing to see uh, how your, your observations are going to change. So really like explore, exploring phenomena and getting systematic observations. Then the second one is the, like determine the values of key parameters. This is a different type of experiments. Generally, these are really like fracture mechanics experiments or rock physics, where you take a piece of rock from a volcano and then you apply a stress and you figure out how much the fracture toughness is, the seismic velocity of a piece of rock, or a fracturing, or uh, measuring the V value of acoustic emissions. You basically uh, stress the sample until it cracks and then you measure all the tiny acoustic emissions that are created by this and you can study this, it's very cool actually, a lot of this rock physics is very very cool and or you can also measure other things like for example people for uh, that look at explosive eruptions, they look in the laboratory at parameters that are very hard to measure for example uh, when you have ash plumes, they get ionized, so due to the friction, they become ionized, these uh, ashes, and then they, um, they go together, you know, they, they uh, basically you form some lumps of ash because of electricity or electrical field. And then you can actually go in the laboratory and reproduce the same situation and measure parameters that you need for your numerical models to actually run because otherwise you don't know how much the different things play a role. So this is very important. Or you can test a hypothesis or a theoretical model. You develop it and then you go there and you test it. And then you design the experiment accordingly. Or you validate a computational model. This is an example where we have these gelatin experiments and the numerical models showing the trajectory. You can do the same with the, with the gelatin experiments and with the simulation, numerical simulation, and then you compare. And uh, you know they are going to have different benefits. For example, the simulations that we saw, numerical simulations, they were 2D. We didn't have the other direction, and actually it's important because you may have a diaper propagating, but then for some reason it stops, and then it would go this way. But this was not possible with the numerical model that I showed you, you know, with this simulation. But in the gelatin experiments you can do, because you can inject the crack and then you can observe as it goes in this direction. On the other hand, you cannot do so many experiments, you can do only a limited number because it's uh, a lot of effort, 
well, a numerical model, you can create a script and a, a thousand or a night. And this you will never be able to do. So actually you can uh, join the benefits of two approaches and uh, be more conscious of the limitations of the two approaches. Because if you have run the directing experiments, then you know, okay, I have a third dimension that I need to discuss because from the models, numerical models, I will not be able to get information on that. And so I can run a gelatin experiment, or in general, I can just have in mind, careful because this I haven't checked. And uh, on the other hand, when you have uh, analog materials, they have, uh, you cannot find, you know, since you have to scale down the experiments, sometimes you would need a given weight, a given density, a given, and you, you, in the range of materials that are available, not always you find exactly the density that you need. For example, when you do gelatin experiments, it would be really good to have densities as low as 0 0.8, 0 0.7, and at the same time low viscosity. But this is almost impossible. What fluid can, can give you a viscosity that is low as air, but having density almost as high as water? It's like uh, you don't have these combinations. And then you are limited in the combinations, you know, from the materials that you, that exist. <coughs> Sometimes new materials are invented with weird rheologists and this is very interesting to, to check a different hypothesis. Uh, but sometimes it's just a limit. But then in the numerical model, you put whatever you want, right? For example, another limit of gelatin experiment, I talked very sharply about that, was the Poisson ratio. That was, uh, since the water is very incompressible as a medium, even more incompressible than rock, if you use water to produce gelatin, this is going to be very incompressible. It's a material that is very incompressible. And actually, if you calculate the Poisson ratio, it's very close to 0 0.5, which is the maximum possible. <coughs> and very low, very distant from actual rock, which is 0 0.25 or 0 0.3. And this is an effect on the stresses. But then you create a numerical model, and then you change the Poisson ratio, and then you recalculate what would be your, so you know, you can play a lot. Uh, and uh, this is just an example, but you can actually do the same. So if you are good with uh, simulations, and you can simulate a lot of stuff, and if you have uh, uh, either by yourself or uh, a good colleague that works in the laboratory, you can check your ideas really nicely. I think it's a very, very good combination to have uh, simulations and laboratory work, just to. It's uh, very inspiring and very useful. Okay, there are two main types. One is with natural material. With natural material, what it means uh, in this paper is really basalt from the volcano, or, uh, you know, well, material that are non -mag so actually magmatic or non magmatic, or really volcanic or non volcanic. Like gelatin has nothing to do with a proper volcano, but you use it nevertheless because you, if you use ba basalt from the field, you are not going to be able to observe what you observe in gelatin at reduced scale. The reduced scale requires a reduced stiffness by orders of magnitude, and you cannot use the natural material for that, right? Otherwise, you recreate a big volcano, but then uh, it doesn't... So basically, you natural materials or magma analogs, for example. Natural, as a rule of thumb, here is there, I think it's a good point, if you are investigating some processes that occur at the very small scale, for example, bubble nucleation or um, uh, crystals or something, then it's better to use the natural material because you can look at it and it's like the real process. But it doesn't need to be, it's just a rule of thumb. While uh, analog materials in general are to be preferred because with analog materials, you can scale down the properties and have your volcanoes as big as this. Um, so if you use volcanic materials, the benefit is that you are really testing the real thing. It's not like a 
take model. And you don't need to scale, it's really the real thing. Um, of course you need to assess whether the boundary conditions are the conditions that it's, uh, you know, what is the large scale process, how is a large scale process affecting your small scale process. Anyway, you have to check these things, but in general it's uh, something that you can prefer if it is possible. Well, if you have analog materials, then uh, um, generally it's less expensive. So basically because uh, a big machine that is able to recreate temperatures and pressures that are crustal you know, conditions, it's very expensive. And you need to buy the machine and you need to operate the machine. And this is expensive. Well, if you have, want to buy the gelatin to recreate a volcano, it costs you really very little, it's cheap stuff. <coughs> you can um, perform better direct observations, really watch, uh, and a bit less time consuming, this of course depends. And so on, there are a lot of uh, reasons here why it's good and bad. Uh, if you use analog materials, you need to be ready to answer to objections, you know, like uh, you will see, you write your papers and then you have the reviewer putting down a lot of objections and you need to be able to answer. So generally when you use analog materials, it's very hard that you are capturing everything, you know, you don't have the full system, you don't have the full interactions, you are only capturing one or two or things at a time. And even when you do scaling, it's uh, generally straightforward to scale down one, two, three properties, but you can't scale down everything, it's impossible, it's generally impossible. And therefore you need to be clever and scale down the things that you think are dominant, dominating your process, and uh, consider those that cannot be scaled down and discuss them as thoroughly as possible. So basically one needs to characterize the analog material, know it, Although, you know, sometimes you agonize to know the properties of the analog material, but maybe to agonize too much to know these properties. So there is a limit to that because it's still an analog material is not your real, your real thing. So you, you stop at some point, right? Because actually your aim is to understand the natural thing. So, you know, it's always like a, you need to consider these things. Okay, scaling. The, the basis for the scaling were already uh, put down many years ago, as you see in these papers, and they already pointed out that three things uh, are needed. So basically geometrical similarities, you need to make your uh, geometry similar to the geometry in nature. Kinematic means that the duration uh, so you need to scale time somehow, if you, especially if you're looking at uh, some processes that are dynamical in nature and, uh, and also dynamic similarities. So the forces and the stresses, in particular if you are looking at the stress, stresses because in geophysics it's about stresses, they need to be similar in orientation and uh, you know, amplitude to stresses that are or scaled appropriately, you know to the rigidity of your system in order that you have uh, everything uh, similar but also scaled down. Um, so basically you, what you do in general is you take uh, a key physical parameter and you create a scale, like for example you want to have, uh, you want to scale stresses, then every stress that you have in your model, you need to be scaled in the same way. For example, if you um, have some compression from outside, you know, you push, let's make the example of gelatin, you push, and then uh, you, you get a uh, compression by three or four millimeters. So then you need to calculate how much strain this is causing, then you have a rigidity, and then you have to multiply the strain by the rigidity to get the stress. And if you want to put a topographic load, then you need your load to be, to be scaled in the same way. So you have a ratio there, 
and you have ratio there. And also the rigidity of your system needs to be more or less in the same ratio, so you have to go back to uh, all the forces and, and scale them um, in a nice way. Okay, here there are some examples. For example, this is with a balloon to create a um, caldera. Um, okay, so the basically um, you need to have uh, a geometry, so if you want to have uh, a, a caldera of 10 kilometers, then you need to scale it down and how everything needs to fit. So. But it's not only about the size, it's also about the properties of the material. So for example, if you have silica flower, then you have an angle of internal friction and then you have, uh, this is also like a, going to be like a originate forces in your model, etc, etc. You need to change and you need to make, take care that everything is done well. But there are several papers that uh, can guide somebody to do this. This is an example of what happens if you have a balloon and you start to drain the balloon and then you create a caldera. It's interesting because the, basically what uh, one needs to uh, to see is that you have, uh, basically you start to form folds like here and then these folds are developing like this, in this way. Okay, and only later so the first motion cannot be really the collapse from the top. The first motion needs to be from the bottom because otherwise mechanically you cannot put a wedge into the, the hole, right? You first need to actually create a fold like this and it needs to go down geometrically in this way. And only later then you can start to actually create the other folds like this. We can see uh, other pictures. Okay, here I don't know why these lights look so bad. I need to have a look. Um, I wanted to show you uh, another example like, of these calderas by silica flower from a group that works in Sweden. Um, or actually Norway, Norway and Sweden. So the observation that they that they did are cone sheets. So in uh, eroded calderas, you find structures that you find dikes, and you find also structures that are cone sheets. You see, this is very inclined, and uh, they are found like this in eroded calderas. They look like cones, so they look like a ring dike, but the, like a, a funnel, funnel shape. And if you, if you find, uh, some, sometimes they are visualized by either seismic, uh, seismics and then you find these, uh, they are called uh, saucer shaped seals sometimes. They are really like balls, they are shaped like balls. You see one eroded here, it looks good. And the question is, how are they formed? Because we find them in the field, so how are they formed? And so these people, what they did, they put uh, some uh, silica flour and they injected some oil into the silica flour to, to see how um, things were proceeding, you know, how to form this. And then they started to, um, to scale all the properties and in particular, what is it? So basically they, they listed all their properties and then they started to think about um, ratios of parameters, you know, that makes the problem a dimensional. For example, they found, it's, uh, it's instructive I think, because they did uh, quite a good work in looking at these uh, uh, dimensions less parameters. For example, this is H is the depth 
and D actually is the diameter of the inlet of their um, <coughs> injector, which, which was here, basically, this, this D. Um, and then they looked at this other pi, other um, uh, parameter, which was basically the viscous stress over the cohesion, the cohesion of a granular material here, how to gather the granular material, how much force you need to apply to separate the granular material um, individual grains. And this is, uh, this is, in, uh, so basically granular materials, I, I already revealed a little bit of the end of the story, granular materials are good if you want to observe faulting and if you want to model media that are uh, relatively non-cohesive because otherwise, for example, if you have gelatin, there is no way, it's very hard to obtain any faulting with gelatin, it's too strong. So gelatin is good if you want to model stuff that is very deep, very cohesive and is not going to break into pieces. If, however, you want to model something that occurs in sedimentary basins, for example, then granular materials are better because sedimentary basins are not that strong, you know, and then you need a medium that is uh, uh, describing this uh, rheology. Also, if you want faults, you need to have granular materials. So basically here, what you can do, like here, viscosity times velocity over D gives you a stress, um, a stress dimension because viscosity is pascal per second so then times a velocity you get a, a length and then if you uh, create over D then you create something that has the unit of a stress and then you can create a, a dimensionless parameter and you can do this, this game you can create a lot of these dimensionless parameters and very often you will find that they are for example, here is another stress size, you know, rho GH. Uh, this is the coupling, basically, is the, the lithostatic weight and the cohesion, okay? And then you can create uh, a lot of these things. So this is like a Reynolds number. Then you have the mass times the length and the velocity over the viscosity. And this describes the ratio between inertia and viscous forces. You can create this game by putting all your parameters together that you think are important into dimensionless things. And very often, if you are good in doing that, uh, you are able to find some controlling things for your dynamics. Then what you do is to check in nature and in the experiment these dimensionless parameters, how much they are. And uh, it's, uh, of course, they are going to show you different numbers, okay, so they are not going to be the same, and you need to discuss this. So basically then you make a create the ratio, so this is another one, it's just buoyancy, 1 minus ro density of magma over density of rock, and you can check what you get. And you have to consider, some of them will uh, tell you that your experiment is actually very representative of nature, some other of these calculations will show you that you are in a different region. And then you need to discuss, you know? So this is what they get if they inject these oils into, um, into the, the, the silica flower. So sometimes they get like a dike here, and then they get something that looks like a hull-shaped intrusion. Sometimes the dike starts earlier, so like the dike uh, goes into this kind of um, cone-shaped intrusion a bit uh, deeper and sometimes you create just a very tiny dike and from there you create a cone sheet. So this is like uh, hybrids, they get these hybrids, they get dikes and cone sheets. And then they start to put into a diagram, you put one of these parameters and the other parameters and you put all your experiments in these diagrams and you see if you have any separation. Here I observe this, here I observe that and my parameters range are this. So basically it's like a phase diagram, okay? You put uh, some controlling factors, which are like here, viscous forces are dominating over inertial, 
Here I have cohes cohesion dominating of uh, you know, granular rheology. Here I have this and that. And then you, like they found that the shape of the result was depending on what was dominating in the different experiments. So this is just, uh, it's a good, a good way to approach analog experiments and it is a good example. One thing that I put, it's because it's funny, because they put actually that they explain gelatin experiments don't show cone sheets and um, they say our experiment shows why, because basically it is too cohesive, so in, a, in the diagram it would have been too cohesive and therefore you wouldn't see any cone sheet, you would see only dikes, because it was too much uh, in this regime, in this uh, regime here, here at the top. Um, it's funny because then actually uh, some models came out, I'll skip this one for a moment, where actually then you just flip the coin, you create, you know, you create a hole in the model, you create a, like a caldera, and then you form a cone sheet. Look at this. Um, I'll show you and you create a cone sheet and it is gelatin but it is just because you created a stress pattern that wants a cone sheet. In the other case it's not a stress pattern, in the other case it's the interaction between the rheology of the injection and the, the granular material and the presence of a free surface because then when it's deep it wants maybe to be like this but then when it's uh, shallower you are closer to the free surface and you tend actually to, it tends to be energetically favored to lift the material rather than just, you know. Well, in this case, you just create a, a stress. So the, the, what I mean to say here is that uh, here you have two ways of modeling dike injections. One is in a granular material and one is in, a, in gelatin. And you, you need to be, um, you need to consider that depending on the, what you want to model, so you can obtain even the same things, but in completely different ways. Um, okay, let's go back here a little bit because I wanted to show you something. Did I show, a, um, I showed you an, 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 a movie with gelatin with this pattern of, yeah. So here is the same, right? So I repeat, there was a polarizer in the back, one at the front, and then you change the refraction index of the gelatin due to stress. So here you see, one thing that I wanted to show you here is this. You see here that you see the stress of the tiny dark, you saw it also in that movie, and we see the stress um, of this, um, gelatin um, hole, you know, um, so many things. Basically the dike moves and creates uh, this cone sheet around this, in this case because of stress, while in the other case it's uh, again a, a similar thing but uh, just for a completely different medium and you create the same shape. Yeah, sorry if it is confusing. It's just to show you that people can be also... confused by this. Okay, let's uh, go back to this. This was uh, it's, uh, in, a, in another paper. And it is actually a fine element model of a gelatin experiment. So again, you have, uh, you want to scale your experiment correctly, but then one of the biggest limit in every experiment is that you have your boundaries. Okay, so uh, even the gelatin is a very good example for that because you have uh, your container. How is your container going to affect your experiment? It's very hard to know, actually. It's not very easy to know. So what can you do? 
to check this. One way to actually do it is uh, if you are good in numerical modeling, then you take a finite element model or a boundary element model and you put it, so you put a zero displacement here at the container wall, zero displacement at the bottom, and then you inject your, uh, you put your pressure source and so on. And then you model your stresses. <laughs> Uh, and you, you model your stress field and you compare with what you would have had without the boundaries and you see if it's similar enough, for example, or if it changes dramatically. And here, basically what it shows is that it does change quite a lot. So for example, here you see that the Poisson's number is this uh, new value, is uh, almost 0 0.5, which is appropriate for gelatin, and here is uh, basically exactly the same, you know, just with the Poisson's number 0 0.25 and the stress field changes a lot. So basically just for the fact, just for the fact that you change the Poisson's number of a medium, you may end up in a completely different stress uh, regime. And in this case the reason is that you have this topography that pushes a lot against the walls and this is and the walls are too close so in this case you would have had to put the walls much much farther away and then but then what you can do is uh, before you start the experiment this is really a clever thing to to do in general is you start your experiment only after that you have checked with a numerical model what are the conditions and if you are really replicating the conditions that you want to replicate in nature so the, the best experiments are done with the homework before, you know, you start to see all your parameters, you start to check your parameter space, you even model your stresses, you model everything, and then you, are, you consider, is this really what I want to model or is this very far away? Because actually what happens sometimes is the opposite. You start to do an experiment in the in the, you know, these uh, four, um, we had a list of the four reasons why you would do experiments. And one, one reason was, I want to get inspiration and I want to actually just try, you know. If you do this, you may end up, then, okay, you see something, you replicate, you replicate, you replicate, then you finish your laboratory time and then you start to actually doing the models. And then only later you realize, oh, actually I wasn't in the regime that I wanted to be in. And then it's fine, you have, but you have to struggle to basically adapt your study to what you actually wanted to have. And if you do it early on, it's better, because then you are able to um, to really simulate what you want to simulate. Um, I wanted to show you so you see here also from, from this model you see better why the tomography showed what uh, it was showing, you know, you see basically this collapse structure and then all the, um, it's like a cylinder of material within the caldera that then uh, as you continue to subside the piston, basically it's going to show you, it's going to um, have a lower density. Okay, do you have any questions on this? No questions. Okay, then, because I, I did it more quickly than I thought. So, maybe I will just show you a little bit more on the geology of Caldera. So I 
will show you a little bit more of calderas. So we do, and tomorrow we will do more. Okay, these are examples of calderas. So in this case, it's uh, like Crater Lake in Oregon. You see a, li a really a very nice um, caldera structure with a beautiful lake. Well, here is Artale and with the lava lake. Have you ever been? No, eh? it must be really <laughs> quite amazing. Okay, ah, did I show you this? Maybe I can show you this. This is a very good. A very good movie. This is the. This is the now is not any longer there. It's disappeared. This lava lake by now. Before it was active for many many years, and you can see with this time lapse. Whoa. <laughs> So what 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 caused this? It really went down the whole the whole. What what caused this uh, phenomenon? It was like really uh, again on the rift system. A dike intruded and it What's completely the drained the lava lake. And, uh, deep layers and uh, magma chamber will be depressed with it. Yes. Sink down. And there was a gravimeter at the side of the lava lake, and it went. Ooh. <laughs> And by by modeling that, they figured out that the that basically the density of the material was very close to the density of water. So by modeling the the gravity signal and the emptying of this thing, they 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 got a very surprising value for the density. They didn't think it was so bubbly that basically it was a thousand, more or less a thousand. Um, Okay, I'm sure there was another, another, what was it, ah, this, okay, also this is cool. It's another, another, this was the, the, the first, uh, Lava Lake drain was on a wide, but it wasn't a big caldera that we showed in the past. It was like a smaller one that was uh, on the rift system. While this here is actually where now the big caldera collapse has happened. I need to wait a minute. Taking a long time. I think I saw notes about the network is not going to work. Huh. Oh. IPM. Ah, oh, like right now. IPM. Yeah. Ah, oh, okay. Uh, <laughs> Very cool. Yeah. Uh, Okay, this shows on this Japanese volcano, the one that we looked at a lot in terms of um, dike. We saw here, it's how the island actually looks like. This is where the dike actually went, uh, um, like it went this way and then it erupted. And you can see that there are a lot of fissures and then this caldera. And uh, this is the uh, photos, like before we had these very cool videos. This was uh, how the caldera evolved. So you had like an inner structure first, like these folds that go like this, they reach the surface and you start to collapse the inner part. And then the outside folds uh, set in and they create this. And in the end you have a very big hole. And now it looked incredible at the time and now we have uh, videos from the other one. So it doesn't look that incredible anymore. And in this study, uh, this very, very good researcher in Japan, they, he started to analyze 
how the diameter of the caldera was increasing, the depth of the caldera, the area, the volume, and everything. And how the faults proceeded, and you had these blocks that were then slipping inside into the caldera. And uh, he made uh, like these very nice maps showing how everything proceeded, and you had like a summit road, like a, a road to walk to the summit that then collapsed into the, the caldera. Um, one simple number is that the eruption, there was an eruption at the volcano, it was 6.8 uh, million of cubic meters, but it was only 1% of the final volume of the caldera. Why that? Because actually everything went into the dark. This is something that a geologist would have not seen unless you have really a geophysics telling you that you know, there was this. Hi. I hope something. Ah, OK. Today is like <laughs> Thank you very much. <laughs> 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 okay, so this is uh, the, some very early, you know, you saw this GPS going apart when the dike propagated and look what happened at the caldera, all the GPS went in, yeah, because everything um, was draining. This, uh, how, and here like a process how you have the magma reservoir feeding the dike and then you have this process by which everything collapses down, and you have basically a cavity migrating upwards. It's called the stopping, where you have all this uh, occurring. And this is another one, it's uh, like uh, in uh, Pinatubo. You can see actually these faults being created, because at Pinatubo, this, this was uh, one of the biggest eruptions that we have witnessed in the last uh, decades. 1991 in Pinatubo, you see these faults that are really these, when you have the draining of the magma chamber, you see the earthquakes that are building these faults, and they are dipping uh, like this, outward dipping faults. And then at the top, you start to have those that actually link the surface to the, to the cavity. Uh, okay, this was another part on the analog experiments. So the very first experiments, people started to actually fill a balloon. And then you would see a big doming in the, in the silica flower. And only later, people started to actually deplete the balloon. And then you have how these faults develop, you know? So you have first, uh, it, it depends on the aspect ratio. So if the reservoir is very large, very wide, and uh, the depth is not very big, then you start to create actually this kind of faults here. Otherwise, if the reservoir is very, very deep, uh, you, well, here is probably also, also because it's like silica flower, then it's not really elastic very much and it starts to collapse from the very first part. Or you form these kind of structures, you know, first these faults, and then uh, it goes up. Or you form uh, first these two faults, and then these other two external faults. It is uh, like this is like how, if you go around calderas in the world, you find that um, uh, some of them, basically, you only are at this stage. You only see what uh, in this paper is called like a downsack. And only when the faults develop and they reach the surface, then you create a reversing fault. So you see a fault that is actually looks like a reverse fault. And later you start to form this, uh, these other faults here. And only when they reach the surface, then you have a normal ring fault. So you generally have two ring faults. One interior, which is like thrust, and the other one, which is normal. What are you doing? <laughs> You are bored to death. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, 
And this actually is seen in many calderas. And here in this graph, I like this graph very much. Um, basically, a lot of calderas around the world are collected and shown in this graph to show that the stage of development, so stage one, two, three, four, Again, it's uh, like uh, subsidence and diameter. Okay, it depends on the diameter what, of the caldera and the amount of subsidence. The amount of subsidence is this at the top, how much they subside. And you can create like a phase diagram where you have only very few calderas that are just <coughs> dump stack. Many are like stage two. And then you have, uh, and you can see that basically everything um, can be described in terms of this ratio. Um, so here is like also how it uh, happens. So basically, you have uh, you start with magma withdrawal, and then you have a cavity that. Uh, so basically, everything migrates down, like the material, but the cavity is like migrating up. And. Uh, and then we will show this that we will do tomorrow because I don't think now I have time. I hope you want to see a differential equation. <laughs> we will see it tomorrow. First, I will uh, describe you what we want to model with the differential equation, which is really caldera collapse as a dynamic phenomenon. First, I'll show you this things and you can uh, look at them in the context of what we saw so happening in, on Hawaii. So here on the y-axis we have uh, earthquakes. So the number, so the energy released in earthquakes at these three caldera collapse. Um, and one can see that the individual earthquakes This is the individual earthquakes and this is the cumulative, uh, let's say, energy. One can see um, that they, but this is strange, seismic energy released. Okay, so in some volcanoes, basically you have a phenomenon, but this is not really the one that I wanted to show you. So you have, you have earthquakes, but then what do you see? Done. <laughs> yeah, <again. laughs> He's having fun. <laughs> yeah. Okay, I'll show you this one. This one is bad. It's good. It's very good. So, okay, this is very good. This is Piton de la Fournaise in La Reunion. Um, and these are, so you are on this volcano and you s suddenly start to see these signals. These are tilt instruments, so they tell you the slope. Mm -hmm. So look at this, basically they are two, uh, two components of the same instrument uh, somewhere on the caldera, on the, on the volcano. And basically you start to see that the instruments go like whoop, whoop, whoop. And this occurred, this is time, is two days, this is two days, one, two days, three days, four days. And uh, you see basically every few hours one of these episodes. So basically what was occurring is like Kilauea. Basically all the collapse occurred in steps. Like, But uh, while it was doing this, it was also like basically like woo, woo, and then you had this tilt. Um, that was not so much. Yeah, I was showing basically this effect. And then I wanted to show another thing. Whoa. Yeah, so this was Mekajima. This was Miyakejima, the tilt uh, instrument. So also this tilt instrument did the same. You would see a lot of this like inflation, deflation, inflation, deflation. This is in short term. Very short term. This was, well actually this is days. 
So in 5 July, 10 July, 15 July, 20 July. So actually more like one per day or a, a couple per day. And uh, some of them are bigger and then they become a bit smaller and then they become a bit bigger. And then I'll show you. Ah, okay, this was Bardabunga. Okay, we talked about that enough. But I wanted to show you this. So this is uh, basically the caldera subsidence. This is like the GPS. The GPS, you see, it goes down and then down and then and then it goes ahead. This is just days. Actually, it went ahead for many months. And this is the earthquake magnitude. So you see that basically every time you have a big earthquake and then you have a collapse, a big earthquake and then you have a collapse. And this is many months and how cumulatively the caldera subsided here you while here you see all this discrete process here what you see is like a smoother uh, maybe exponentially decreasing process and here is like how the caldera became deeper uh, below the ice actually it was difficult to observe because everything is below the ice so it was a bit uh, the subsidence was measured just here on top of the ice. Um, and I'll go back to one figure that was here before, is this. So this is the time interval between the collapses, maybe here, no, here. Okay, it's only Miyakejima. Here, the time interval between the collapses, this is the date, and this is the time interval in minutes, okay? A bit of a weird unit, minutes, and then you have 500. Well, anyway. And you can, could see that basically every... At Miyakejima was like a weird... At first it was this high, then it, they became more often. We saw it in the figure with the tilt. And then at some point they became more rare. Why? If you look, so, and these are the red dots, but if you look at Fernandine and Pitot de la Fournaise, they are doing actually exactly the same. So basically it was very smooth. It was just, uh, uh, you know, the intervent time was like very regular. It started, you see, it's like, uh, it's normalized by the maximum. So like Fernandina was occurring in, uh, how long did it take in Fernandina? A few days like a week, Piton de la Fournaise just a couple of days, but if you normalize by the longest, you know, they are doing exactly the same. They start like here and then they go a bit more uh, distant from each other and then they accelerate, you know, yes, and then, and then it stops. Um, and tomorrow, and uh, we will go through the model um, published by Kumagai, he's a Japanese scientist who described this uh, phenomenon very well in terms of uh, an equation that describes the motion of a piston within, uh, like sliding on the, on, on the wall and uh, basically we will see that uh, if you have a magma chamber being drained from below and you have this piston, then this is exactly what you get if you solve the equation. Like that you have a, like a phenomenon that occurs in steps, episodic like this, and that it evolves. And it's a very cool model. Okay, questions? Also on everything, like on... on everything we discussed. So uh, on the map you showed us uh, on the South Arabia lakes. Yeah. So there is a lake, a lake in Ethiopia. So around it there is a lava flow. Okay, let's go back. Here. Map. Yeah. Yeah. <coughs> ah, here. You mean here or here? Yes, yeah, yeah, it's right here. So that's a lake. Lava field. 
Yeah, it means yeah. like a bal like flow. Flower so there was a flow. I think this is a lava. F what is it? <laughs> you can tell me better what it is. It is a. Uh, it's not in the. No, it, the this is the this is the rift area. Yeah, so it's right here, on it's on the plateau. Yeah. It's yeah. On the plateau. Do you know about that? Actually, I don't know. I will look into the figure if you like. But I know that there are some lava fields also on the plateau, uh, right? I, I think I heard that it's uh, a crater lake, but it's too wide to be a crater lake. Oh it yes, if it is wide. here, it's too wide. Yeah. I can have a look, I don't know. But there are lots of uh, volc extinct volcanoes yeah. all over the northern Italia. In the plateau, yeah. yeah. The big mountains. So generally, I think they they what they um, here in this uh, they plot in orange is more like uh, magma or lava without a clear edifice. I think it's more lava field. It means like you have it's the lava, straight. but you don't have the volcano basically. Mm -hmm. So I don't know this one in particular. I I try to figure out. Because you have a lot of these fields here, you actually have like an elevated range, but you have a lot of lava fields without really many volcanoes, and they they are. Um, um, They're not erupted. So it's eruptions, yeah. but they occur from fissures, and all the time the fissures are in a different location, and then this means that you create a big lava field. The eruptions are big sometimes. And you create a lava field, but you never develop an edifice actually. And the next eruption is going to be somewhere else. And uh, here in the Arabian Peninsula, it's not really very well studied because there was not so much. Uh, you know, even now, scientists cannot go f come from abroad to study the area. It's like uh, you must be invited yeah. <laughs> to go there. And actually, they started to study it. Uh, it's very, very sparse. And I think only now they, they are studying quite a lot in this new university that was created a few years ago, Kaust. <coughs> I have colleagues in this university and they are uh, doing a lot of work now to, to know better the tectonics and the magmatism in the area, but it's actually very mysterious. It's just these fields are mapped and they are very large and it's, uh, there are studies, so I, now I would... Uh, say something very imprecise, but what I know is that it's not really clear where they come from. I think it's deep magma, you don't see magma chambers or anything close to the surface, it's quite deep. And I think also compositionally it's quite deep. And it's definitely related with the, North, with the Red Sea because it's aligned, so it must be a very big link, but it's not very well understood. And of course in terms of hazard it's big, because you have towns all, all uh, along the Red Sea and these fields, you see, they are everywhere. So you never know what the next one is going, going to be. Yeah. And there are big cities also. There are also big cities. But I think also, um, now I may be confused by Jeddah. So Jeddah is here, is big, right? Mm -hmm. And then Medina, isn't it? Medina is also close to Jeddah. And yeah. even Mecca is close to Jeddah, right? A bit yeah. farther away, and they, they, you have also there lava fields, right? Where? In, in, Medina? in, in Medina and Mecca. I, don't know. I, I think, think so. I think yes, in Mecca. Yeah. Historically. See, yes, not very mm. recent, yeah. but there are. Yeah. Ah, Medina is here. It's indicated just mm. at the boundary, mm. and Mecca is not indicated. But I think people, when they go to Mecca, they land in Jeddah, right? So it must be not very far away. Yeah, the pilgrims. They go by bus from Mecca to Jeddah. Yeah, exactly. It's not so yeah, so. <laughs> Why do these fields appear in Saudi Arabia and not in the immediate sides? Why? Why these fields? Love eh, this is a very good question. It's a very good question. Actually, this I think is common in and rifts. Because of the stress field there. Well, it's um, going to, uh, 
to do that? Yeah, no, it's, a, it's actually a very good question and I think it occurs very often in rifts that you have uh, the rift as magnetism on one side and not so much on the other side. Mm -hmm. And very often it's asymmetric rifts where you have one side of the rift that is much more elevated or has a big gravel, like rifts sometimes, they are like half gravels. No. They look like, uh, sometimes you have the folds and then you have the rift and it looks like this. But sometimes you have like half a graben. So this is like the early development phase is more like half a graben and then only later they develop into full graben. And when you have a half a graben, sometimes you have like the volcanoes are only on one side, sometimes they are uh, uh, on both sides, but they have uh, different features. And we tried actually to simulate this um, with the uh, gelatin and having like half a graben in the numerical models and in the gelatin. And you would see that it was uh, different, the propagation on one side and the other side. So one possible explanation is that actually everything comes from the middle. So like below the Red Sea, you have actually most magma. This is could be controversial, eh? it's just my interpretation and it doesn't need to be the truth. But it could be that the magma is generated by the compression with, the, you know, like a mid-ocean ridge style at this point, but um, still is not super developed in the middle, it's still very young, so some of it uh, still ascends in the modality continental rift and it uh, ascends at the side. But then you have a different stress field due to the fact that it's not, uh, it's not, uh, yeah, the, the, it's much more elevated, I think, in the Canadian uh, Peninsula. Is that true? I think it's more elevated. So it's uh, asymmetric, asymmetric stress. And then most magma tends to go on one side. The displacement uh, is almost symmetric from the area. The displacement is, but you do not necessarily the topography is, uh, is yeah, the displacement while well, it's just opening, yes. Yes. And actually relatively homogeneous along the rift is just, I think, decreasing, right? It's uh, like opening more slowly towards the north and opening more quickly towards the south, I think. It's like, a, there is a, like a slight rotation like this. Here it's fast, it's fast. Yes, and in the north is not magmatic. The more you go to the north and the less, so it becomes non magmatic. You have, but you have a lot of seismic so There is a sense of rotation. Yeah. yeah. And they told me they want to build a bridge. And uh, yeah, I don't know why. There is where. a new city there. Eh? There is a new city. A new city, like in the north, here? Yeah. I in think. The three countries. Ah. Okay. <laughs> yeah. It's a very active, eh? very active both physically <laughs> and uh, politically. Yeah. So I what I heard from the colleagues in Kaos is that they want to build a bridge, but it's actually a location where you have large earthquakes and so they are now doing the studies to understand uh, whether it makes sense to build a long bridge in that particular location. Ah, one thing that I forgot to tell you is um, Iceland area in the north where you have the big earthquakes. The last one was 130 years ago, I think, more or less 140. It was magnitude 6.4 or 2 magnitude 6.2, I can't remember. And if you calculate the tectonic strain, I mean, you can never really do this calculation, but definitely you could have uh, another six already stored mm -hmm. in there, and they just built a um, plant, which is a silic silicon smelter, which I learned is a silicon smelter is like a, um, they basically, they want to create pure silica, mm -hmm. they take quartz from they have a deep harbor because there is like a fjord. They come in with the ships and they bring the, the, 
the quartz and then in this plant they melt it to be up to 1800 degrees so it's really high temperature and they drilled into a volcano I want to show you because it's also a very interesting thing where is it the map here so they drilled into this volcano they created a power plant here they drilled into the volcano they bring the heat here they have uh, a harbor, it's the town Husavik, exactly here, just below the fault, just south to the fault. And the plant is here, power pl the plant, the silicon smelter. So they bring the heat from the volcano into the smelter, they come in with the ships into the fjord, and they, f uh, and they, s they send it back from the harbor, and they drilled a tunnel to link the harbor with the plant through the fault. And uh, they assured that the plant is uh, safe up to magnitude seven. So basically, they constructed up to magnitude seven. Now I'm at, now I wonder whether they also made because these smelters are like big. Uh, so I have uh, I'm full of questions. Anyway, <laughs> it's like a very you know very so keep your. Uh, Yes, so then maybe in the future we will hear about it. So definitely an network will come and uh, the plant I think is operational now. So you have a question? If the um, silicon smartery will be destroyed, there will be a silicon flow. A silicon flow, a silica flow. So there, there will be, yes, there is a big container with uh, molten silica, 1800 eight, degrees. <laughs> Make a lot of fun. Yeah, but I think the, the workers need to be very careful because if these things are still. Yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. They took uh, in a lot of workers from mainly Poland, because I hear like Polish people, they don't hear the temperature in Iceland. In North Iceland, they are used to very low temperatures. So they are happy to emigrate in Iceland, and they are good workers. So it's, uh, they, they, it's uh, impressive. They dig into the volcano, they dig all the workers for the power plant, and then they build the, the neighborhood for the workers in the plant. It's really like a energy. Yeah. So you have this uh, interaction of uh, natural phenomena and hazards with uh, with the need of small communities to have some development. And how are you going to regulate this? It's very hard. So the geologists didn't want that they chose uh, this location because they thought it was very crazy to have a tunnel going through the fault and. Uh, you know, and have all these uh, hazards, and they could have chosen a different location, it was just uh, less convenient, because here it was very convenient having a deep harbor and the volcano for the, for the power. Yeah, but then, uh, <laughs> yes. Okay, so... Um, we will continue tomorrow. Tomorrow we will start with this caldera collapse. And then, I'm not sure what to do later. We'll see. Okay.
they're still alive. Yeah. <laughs>